What's going on, growers? It's James Prigioni coming to you live from Jersey. So far this summer, it's been our greatest ever. The food forests have grown so much and the production, it's off the charts. Additional to this too, Team Grow is expanding so fast. And the best part about this expansion is my ability to connect with more of you. I can honestly say, without your comments, without your encouragement, I don't think I'd be making videos right now. So today, I wanna to answer some of those comments so I can give more value to Team Grow. Let's go. The first question comes from Fountains of Living Water. They said, James, what do you do with your harvest? Do you sell it at the farmer's market? Actually, I don't. The first thing I do with my harvest is obviously I eat it. Second, I try to store some of it. And then third, the main thing I actually end up doing is giving it all away. You're probably thinking, James, that's a lot of work for no pay. Honestly, it's all about how you look at it. I do get paid, not just monetarily. Being able to give this food to people, open their minds and show them that there's a major difference between something you grow your own and something you buy from the store. Anything I can do to get someone on Team Grow, I'm gonna do it. The other thing is, this food, the quality in my opinion is so high, you can't get better, the best stuff in the world. I couldn't even charge the prices that I think are worth it. It wouldn't even make sense. Rather, I just give it away. I honestly don't think a lot of people would appreciate it because it's not that it takes a lot of work to create this food, but it just takes a kind of philosophy, a kind of system, a kind of thing that you really can't get from the store. The next question comes from Judy. She asked James, where do you get all those wood chips? And secondly, do you ever have any problems with snails or slugs in your garden? Let me start out with the wood chip part. First, I actually get all my wood chips from two locations. The first and my most favorite one is to get it from someone who's just cutting a tree down locally. The best time is around you know, late fall when the trees still have their needles and leaves. You wanna make sure they have the green leaves on them because that's great actually compost when you first put it down. That'll break down the quickest, feed your worms and everything like that. The other resource I use is just a local recycling center. And those wood chips, they don't have the green material in it, so they still work well as like a mulch, but they're not gonna feed your soil as quickly and as well as something like the Fresh Arbor wood chips. So that's mainly where I get them, my two locations. If you can't find a spot like that, you can go on a website. I'm pretty sure it's Get Chip Drop, but I'll put a link down here or I'll put the website right there just so you guys can check it out. But I really think if you want the chips, you gotta get out there, you gotta look for them, you gotta put the work in. A number of times I've gotten chips just by just driving around locally and seeing someone cutting a tree down. I went up to the people and said, hey, I live around the block, I wanna drop them off in the driveway, and that's how it works out. To answer the second part of that question, which was do I get any snails or slugs in here? No, I can't say that I regularly do. I live in a location that, I mean, this year we've got a good amount of rain, but it's not a very, very wet climate. We do have high humidity because we're close to the ocean, but it's not super, super wet like you would get, I guess, some places in England and stuff, and London. So we don't have bad snail issues. But if I did have snail problems, I wouldn't fight against the snails too much. I'd change my perspective a lot like Jeff Lawton does. I wouldn't have a snail problem. I'd realize that I have a, a duck deficiency. What do I mean by that? Uh, what I'm saying is, the reason you have a snail problem or an overabundance of snails is because you don't have predators which are going after those snails. So you might not have a problem, you just might need to add something else instead of trying to take things away. So when you get a balanced system, everything works in harmony. And that's just a learning process. So I would look at things a little differently and make sure that I'm not fighting circumstances, that I'm getting at the root of issues and I'm trying to work to get that system actually taking care of itself. Removing myself from the system as much as I can. That's kind of the goal. Another question you guys ask me sometimes is, who's the chicken that always follows me and tuck around? There's one of them. One chicken that's always a part of it. She used to be the runt, but now actually she's a, she's a leader. She holds things down. The only one that steps up to tuck too. That's Forrest. She's a Rhode Island Red, and she doesn't back down literally from anyone. Let me show you her. Forrest is four years old and she's actually not the most docile and sweetest chicken, but overall, she's probably our best chicken. She can forage really well. She's quick, she's active, she's alert. Anytime I throw any grubs or anything, she's on it first. So, one thing about chickens and all animals is so fun is they all have their own personalities. I've got two Rhode Island Reds, both females, both from the same uh, you know, flock, but very different personalities. That's one thing I love about animals and chickens too. These chickens are mainly retired. They don't lay as many eggs as like a one or two year old chicken would, but they've done a really good job for me. They still work, mixing things up in here and a lot of the old cucumbers and stuff we couldn't eat, things that have went bad, they pick at them and they work composting. 
So they're a part of the system just as much as anything else. Bill Mollison talks about how you cannot take away the animals from the forest. They are the messengers. They're the ones that move things around. So we bring these in the chickens in the food forest selectively. We can't leave them in there all the time or they'll just rip up the annuals and stuff. I feel so blessed to be a part of this movement, quickly growing, and to be able to see your gardens on Facebook, on YouTube. You guys show me the pictures, the things you've started. You've gone from nothing, you're harvesting food, and that's amazing. A number of you asked also, are we gonna be producing any Team Grow shirts? And to answer yes or no, I don't think that would be exactly Prigioni style but just know that there's always things going on in the background and we always like surprising you guys, so just keep an eye out. Timothy asked, what do you guys do with your odd shaped fruit or your fruit that falls to the ground? That's a great question. Previous years, I had just let it fall to the ground. I didn't worry too much about it, but then I did a little research. I realized and learned the reason some of this fruit was falling to the ground is because we had a pest, the curculio, something I talked about in previous videos. This pest actually cuts into the fruit, lays eggs in there, and that larvae grows up, eats the pit, and that actually rots the fruit. That fruit then drops to the ground, like you can see down here. After the fruit drops to the ground, that life cycle continues. So if I leave this fruit on the ground in my garden, the next life cycle of that curculio are gonna grow up and attack my trees in the spring. So what I do is I remove it. Not only off out of the garden, but I wanna remove this from the whole property. Then I'll bring the chickens in in the spring, they'll tear some of the stuff out and remove the bugs also. So what we don't wanna do is be harboring these bugs. We wanna break that life cycle. Eric asked, do you water your garden with city water? Actually, I'm blessed that I have a well. Even though I live in a suburban neighborhood, I'm on a third of an acre, which is nice. And the house that I'm on was actually built in 1964. It's one of the older houses locally, and we have a well, which makes me really fortunate because I know well water is actually a lot better for your soil. It's got higher calcium, and it's better than that city water with all that fluoride in it. No bueno. Another question I often get has to do with my diet. People want to know, am I a vegetarian? People want to know, do I eat the chickens or do I just eat the eggs? Do I even eat the eggs? So my diet actually isn't something that comes 100% from the garden. Some of you have wondered, but to be honest with you, I just don't produce enough food and I'm not good enough at process it, processing it and storing it to be able to support myself for the whole year. I do eat as much of it as I can out of here and I do my best to eat a healthy, natural diet. I try to stay away from any pesticides, any herbicides, any kind of things like that, but I'm not 100% vegetarian, and I'm not a vegan either, obviously. But I do eat my chicken eggs. There are some of the only eggs that I do eat. I eat some local meat too, but in my ideal world, would I go all vegetarian, all vegan, all natural from my garden? If I had the space, I probably would. But I'm not a zealot in any kinds of things. When it comes to gardening, I mean, I, I won't use pesticides, but I'm open to adopt new things. I don't think I know everything. The only reason I believe that I'm a good gardener is because I can admit that I know nothing, or at least I know very little. And I think that's what allows me to learn more and more. Masanobu Fukuoka talks about it, how human knowledge is pointless when growing food, when gardening, in this way with natural farming, because you know the human mind is so disconnected from the natural natural things. It's kind of funny, but a lot of the questions I get to have nothing to do with gardening. One of them that comes often is, am I married? And a second one is, who's filming all the time? So let me start with that one. I'll show you guys who's actually filming right now. You thought I was going to reveal that stuff, huh? Well, I will probably shortly, maybe one day, but I got to keep you guys anticipating, keep you wanting more. Another question I got is, what are my three favorite varieties of tomatoes to grow, mainly for flavor? Here's number one for me, Sun Gold Cherry. This thing is the best, by far my favorite tasting uh, tomato. So good and productive. It's a hybrid, which means it's just not an heirloom. And that's okay, it doesn't mean it's not, G it doesn't mean that it's GMO. There aren't really any GMO tomatoes that I know of. What it means is you don't really want to save seed from it. So this is my favorite tasting, the Sun Gold Cherry. Tuck doesn't like tomatoes, but he does like everything else as you know. Another one I love a lot is the Brandywine Pink. Reliable and incredibly delicious. Love the flavor of this one. And uh, again, it's gotta go up there for my top three. Another one in there is definitely the Soldaki. I love this one for uh, tomato sandwiches. Probably my favorite tomato sandwich one. Incredible reliability. Someone asked how to spell the Soldaki. It's S-O-L-D-A-C-K-I. So everyone should have this one in their garden, I think. Super reliable. That potato leaf usually gives better disease resistance. So those would be probably my favorite three varieties flavor-wise. That's why I'm growing them though. 
I always try to have these in. Sometimes I'll do the uh, a different brandy wine, but I always try to have one of those. Always, always have Sun Gold Cherry. Always have Soldaki. Then I just add different ones in for fun. And you know, because I'm always changing, and I'm always trying to find the new best ones. Let me know which ones you guys think are best. Put in the comments what's your favorite uh, flavor, favorite tasting one. I have the Super Sweet 100s these, this year. Those are excellent as well, but personally, Sun Gold Cherry still beats it out in my opinion. That's today's video growers. Thanks for watching. I hope I answered some of your comments, cleared a few things up for you. One thing I want to mention though, just because I don't answer your comment uh, you know, on text or I don't give a like to it, doesn't mean I didn't see it. I've been getting a lot of comments recently, which makes me you know, so ecstatic, so much fun, but I read every single one of them. Like I said, they're what encourage us. They're what keep us going, and without those comments, more videos aren't coming. But if you guys enjoyed it, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button, share it with your friends. Check us out and steam it. I know we say this at the end of every video, but it truly makes a difference. Hit that notification bell too, if you wanna to see more of Tuck and James Prigioni continuing to grow. We'll see you in the next one. We out.